you both for your um, artistic interventions and the storytelling. Can we have Chao with us now? Actually, I was wondering, I knew a bit about your interventions and I was wondering um, how to design this conversation and was deciding, and we discussed this beforehand, this will not be a panel discussion, meaning individual questions for, for the three of you, but I would rather suggest to come up with some topics that touches all of your work and then just enter in conversation and let's, let's talk about it, let's share our ideas um, all together and the audience is invited to share your thoughts as well. Um, before we do that, I would like to start with a little, with a brief exercise, um, just to get a bit down, concentration again, um, picking up what Chao was talking about in the beginning, how landscapes are um, archives and places of memories. And I would like us to all just for a minute and also the digital audience close your eyes and we just, just think about a place and landscape which is connected to some memories. We don't have to share this afterwards, just, just for you a little moment. We do this, I don't know, 30 seconds. Close your eyes, think of a place and la landscape in nature which is connected to to memories, whatever it is, positive, negative. Okay. Bringing you back again from wherever you were with whatever thoughts you had. Um, so the first topic I would like to talk, talk about with you, um, landscape, nature, and memory. How is this interwoven for you personally? Let's talk about this. So what comes into your mind? What do you think? Landscape and memory. I think for me it's the, like why are those separate concepts? Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. Then I, I, because I think a lot in preparation for this, I've been thinking a lot with kind of what it means to call things natural. Why are some things natural? And is nature something that exists outside of us? As, as Harriet was saying, is it, is it something that lives outside of our being? And then if it is, then what does that make us? Are we part of nature's kind of, are we part of the natural project? Mm -hmm. So then if memories exist inside of us and we are part of this natural project, then why is landscape and memory a different conversation? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. just I yeah. don't have an answer. <laughs> and this yeah. also uh, resonates in what Yu Chao said about um, this is something fluid, it's not static. Memory is not static, mm -hmm. landscape is not static. There's life in both of it. And it's very nice how Harriet um, put this in the mm -hmm. image that she puts herself into the image to make clear I'm part of this, I'm not outside mm -hmm. of this. Yeah, I generally feel that when we think of landscapes, as you've already said, is that people think of it as something abstract, something mm -hmm. outside of us, something very also grand. And um, people fail to look at what is minuscule in, in, in a landscape. So for me, a landscape is. Um, all the moments that I share with my siblings or my, my, my grandparents. And I did mention the foot of a tree as being a key location that is a site that to me in my culture is a landscape, right? That place that sort of calls people together, that place that has uh, in many ways a kind of larger than life function in that it is where people go to feel seen, to feel centered, it's where people go to bury, it is where people go to live again, and that there are things that exist there that of course we do not understand because mm. we have access to certain things and not to other things. And um, these are all landscapes, and also think of, thinking about like emotions and, 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 and the, those landscapes that live within us, you know, that we do not really tend to talk about 
often because maybe we do not consider them landscape enough as they are not appearing as grand structures. And yeah, so I'm thinking about landscapes like you though as well, like just thinking of them as things that we are in, things mm -hmm. that are part of us in many ways, mm -hmm. I would say. Chao, you want to share your thoughts on it? Um, absolutely. Just to add on to what has been said, I recently came across this um, tweet. Oh, it was very helpful. Some are not. <laughs> this one was. I recently came across this tweet that said that as long as people think that animals do not feel, animals will have to feel that people do not think. And so for me, I think landscape really is about the feeling. Um, it's the feeling within you, but also realizing that everything is feeling as well, not just you, um, that everything is hurting, that the landscape is hurting, that nature is hurting as much as you, if not more. And so it's that recognition that the empathy which you can afford to extend within um, is empathy that you have to um, extend without as well in relation to your environment and um, what we have been taught to consider as human beings are above nature and above environments, especially kind of in the Western framework of looking at where the human being sits in relation to everything else. And so this feeling cuts across everything. Yeah. Yeah, and also what came into my mind is um, sites have, or landscapes have a certain spirit. I mean, we, we have this sensation in Europe, for example, where on these sites where the concentration, the Nazi concentration mm -hmm. camps were. I mean, there are lots of uh, memorial sites, but even if there aren't, there is something there. You can feel a certain, you can, you can feel that something happened there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I also think we generally think of landscapes as things that you can possess. Mm -hmm. I remember being a kid and speaking with my grandfather and he was like standing on, on, on the lands that he had held um, sway over and showing from a distance and saying, this is where our land extends to. And um, you can own only that much or this is, you know, kind of sort of showing it as, uh, as, as a kind of, or at least it is regarded as a landscape only when it comes to who gets to inherit what and who gets to, 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 to give it to, the, to, to, to their kids and to the next generation. And so maybe we have to sort of divorce ourselves from that, from that notion as well, that landscapes are things that we can own, that, mm. but they're, that they're with us and that, and that we, we, we give them on whether or not we make that conscious decision to say, you as the son gets to inherit it or not, that it is something that is fluid mm -hmm. indeed and that it is continuous and that um, we have a responsibility to um, its preservation. Um, and, and, and thinking that it is sort of, you know, a communal collective, um, something that, is, um, that, 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 that belongs to all of us in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, no, just, <laughs> I will shut up this time. But what work does landscape do as opposed to land? Mm -hmm. What happens when we call it land? Mm. Right. Because I think there's something uncomfortable about landscape. Because mm -hmm. landscape is what, you know, it's, it's something virgin, it's something that needs conquering, right? Landscape mm -hmm. is what a visual artist will look at and paint. Mm -hmm. I'm a landscape painter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So landscapes tend to be way far removed from mm -hmm. our existence than when we say the land. Like mm -hmm. when some of us, depending on what your kind of your epistemic believes are, it's that land has memories. I don't know about landscape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know land has memory, land holds memory, but landscape is something a lot more, it's something that I can't connect with. It, it mm -hmm. just sounds like, mm -hmm. you know, cartography. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, yeah, I, I was mm -hmm. just wondering yeah. about why you choose landscape and not land. Mm -hmm. not land. Yeah. 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 Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe this is already a sign of imposing our notion of nature on nature, mm -hmm. <laughs> not calling it land, but <laughs> landscape. Yeah, I think for me, landscape, um, it feels, 
like it extends beyond what I know. So I, I feel like when I say land, it's like what I can visualize and what I can picture. Mm-hmm. And in a strange way, landscape feels like there's aspects I can bring, I can conjure into my mind and there's things I cannot. And so landscape is kind of at least the things I know and the things I don't know, but mm-hmm. things that sit together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Conceptually, mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Is there any thought in the audience to this topic about landscape or land and memory? So here in the front, several people, Harriet, Siga, Aisha. Yes, I mean, I just wanted to understand why did you differentiate them yourself, landscape and land? Is it the emphasis when you put scape, it becomes more sophisticated? Landscape. <laughs> Versus land. Mm-hmm. So I mean, like for purposes of full disclosure, I don't think from English. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which mm. then gets lost, right? Because I have a word for land in other languages. Mm-hmm. I don't have a word for mm-hmm. landscape. So in my imagination, I don't know what landscape is. Mm-hmm. I can explain it, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, in Icelandic, in in like. Older Icelandic, the word landscape was landsleg, which means like land womb. I always liked that very much, you know, mm-hmm. because the landscape is like something you scape, something you do to the land. You kind mm-hmm. of, you know, put it mm-hmm. into boxes, mm-hmm. this part and this part. But uh, the old version is, yeah, the womb, the mm-hmm. land womb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I, I, sure. Hey, thank you. Um, I just want to ask about where water is in that, because I think there's always that people differentiate mm. between land and water. And in Malay, mm. for example, the word for mm. homeland is tana air, which is land, water, watery land, and obviously mm. it's part of an archipelago. Um, but how you know people live with sources of water as well as land, because it's of, it's like it's a very terror focus, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. So I just wonder where water plays in. I just think that memory escapes land. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting question regarding the water. I think it's water is obviously fluid, and <laughs> therefore it's more complicated to understand and to like. I don't know. I was just thinking about it. it's it's very personal, but anyway, I share it with you. Uh, thinking about uh, my, when my father died a few years ago, he did not want to be buried, but. Uh, he wanted his uh, children to spread his ashes in the Mediterranean Sea, and that's what we then did. We'd had an av- adventure to carry his ashes mm. across the border to France from Germany, um, travel regularities, mm. even after death. Um, and we did that, and I remember that it was very beautiful when, we, when you put the ashes in the water, and then it's like clouds underwater, and then it disappears. And till today, I'm quite angry for my father that he wants us to do this because he somehow disappeared. I don't have this place to go, you know, to, to memorize him. So it's too big. The ocean is too big somehow for me. Oh, oh sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I just kind of wanted to say, like, I... I've been working on a film about my family farm in Alabama, and it's like 688 acres, which is a lot, but it was part of the original plantation that my ancestors worked on as slaves, but it's ours now. Um, and so one of the things I always think about land is my, my family is very connected to it because they're farmers, but how in the South it's also like this palimpsest, like there are all these layers that you're living on top of that include memory and work and labor and slavery and all these other things. And so I'm always curious about the things that people are doing on top of those layers to not listen to them or not hear them. Mm. Uh, uh, Yes, because remember when I said, when you talked about your father and water and the fact that you see we can't own water 
mm. and we ca we can't own air. You see, mm. water and air. Even if you have, let's say you're an, you're an Ameri you're American and you own over American air, you can't do one, two, three. That's what I was reading on the flight manual, something like that. Mm. You see, you can never really like stay and live in the air. You can't live on the water, and that's why you felt like there is no place. Mm. So why do we think we can occupy land in the same way? You know, mm -hmm. and funny enough, when we talk now, when we bring in the womb and the water, it becomes more feminine. So I think landscape is a bit solitary, maybe harsh and masculine, not masculine. I don't want to say I'm anti-masculine. And maybe now watery and womb becomes this place that you stay in for a while as you transition through the world or whatever it is. I have a problem with the feminization of anything because... <laughs> <laughs> and particularly as somebody from a colony, because also we know this, that this idea of private property and the idea of conquering lands starts with white men mm. calling places virgin and penetrating them. And I, this is me coming I'm from post-colonial, that... This feminization of things always makes them available for conquering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it makes me really uncomfortable. And I do appreciate that languages will cause, you know, whether it's a womb or uterus or whatever, but then there's something that this language avails mm -hmm. for, for practices of violence. So mm -hmm. I just didn't mm -hmm. point that mm -hmm. out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jockey, you wanted to say? Um, I, I was just thinking about how um, the ethnic group I come from um, is, is, is stereotypically uh, known to, to be a little land hungry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the, 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 the histories of that are deeply colonial, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I remember a thing that my parents and, and a lot of my relatives say, which is that everybody should have, and this, this comes back to the idea of what, why land should even be private. Like, why should one person have one title deed for a little bit of a square of the earth that they can call their own? But then I think about my parents and, and my older aunts and, and people like that talking about how everybody should aim to have a piece of land such that if you're ever chased away, you have somewhere to go that they cannot chase you away from. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hmm. <laughs> so I was like, okay. I mean, like, if let's hold space for this thought in its entirety, which then means that you have to plan for the eventuality of a thing that will chase you away from where you belong. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like now when you go back to Kenyan history, mm -hmm. there's so many stories of people being chased away from places mm -hmm. that they formerly mm -hmm. belonged and even places that they may have had a title deed for, which then also renders this argument moot that you will always have a place to run to. Yeah. Yeah. And again, because the entire idea of, of being a refugee, right, um, is about being chased away from a place that you belonged and having to eke out another belonging mm -hmm. elsewhere. But I wanted to talk about that as regards mm -hmm. land and the idea mm -hmm. that if you have a land, a piece of land somewhere, even if it's like a sliver, it is a safe space for you. That's not necessarily true, but a lot of, there's a lot of belief around that mm -hmm. um, for any number of reasons. And the second thing I wanted to talk about was digital real estate, and it would be great to hear um, from Chao in that regard um, of these places where, like, land in the metaverse and people, you know, buying pixels of space. For, and so it's like all this speculative trade for me is so interesting, but it also kind of um, begins from who is creating value in a random pixel somewhere. There's also the idea of the, the air above the pixels or whatever, so people are buying also upwards, not just space on the ground, right? Um, and this kind of, um, because, because as of now, we don't have a continuum between physicalized experience and the experience of being in the metaverse, the, the matrix hasn't happened yet, right? 
Um, but then when that continuum arrives, what does it mean if there are people who are buying land in the metaverse now? Right? And will there be people who will never be able to buy land in the metaverse because, again, of, of digital, um, digital access problems? Um, and what is this idea that, <laughs> that you must own a hypothetical or digital land as well as physical land, which is quite wild? So I was just thinking about those two things. Well, I think that's, that's such a good question, Joki. I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I have an answer to that. Maybe just kind of my thoughts and reflections on this. Um, you know, begin with something that uh, I think it was Jim Chuchu said that, you know, we've not even understood our present realities yeah. and we're investing millions and millions of euros and dollars and, you know, however much money to create these other realities. And I think for me it's it's very interesting because the idea of this whole illusion of digital land is premised on the fact that there's scarcity mm. and so there's somehow <laughs> in this new world that's been created there's already scarcity and there's not enough for all of us and therefore we have to compete for it we have to outbid each other and the impetus for that i think goes back to what we're seeing in real life in the sense that so much of the systems that we've come to inherit or we found ourselves in are essentially designed to either own us or keep us in a continual framework of being owned or belonging to something else. And whether it is a form of colonialism, I definitely think it is because the infrastructure of the digital world is not being built by a communal collective collaborative group of people who have the best interests of everyone at heart we know who owns the money we know who owns the infrastructure um we know where the even the physical infrastructure of the internet sits and so you buy that land and one day um there's global warming it's too hot and the servers are down what happens you know so i think i think it's it's scary um whether there is potential or promise, um, as, as, as you, you very <clears throat> gracefully mentioned, is that we don't even have a lexicon or a reference of continuum between these two worlds. And all of a sudden we have to fight for it. You know, so and I may not have the answers to those questions, but I do think that collectively the, the, why, the why for me is very important. Like why, is this, why is this something that I need to to fight for? Why is it something that needs to be occupying my mind when I'm dealing with so many things in the real world that I'm not even fully, uh, fully aware of yet? Mm. Thank you, Chow. Um, I would suggest to jump to another topic uh, related, of course, um, land as an infrastructure of memories and storytelling as a practice of memorizing. So we talked about land, memory, now the practice of storytelling, how to talk about land, how to find words. Okay. Any thoughts on this? There's a line in your, in your text, Leonga, there's something that speaks in a tree. Yeah. I, when I think of, well, storytelling on, on, on place, on site, on location, I'm, I'm always thinking about um, what a site means, in what way um, do we listen to a site, and, um, and, and how have our ancestors listened before us, and how does that legacy, or how is that legacy kept alive? And, and of course, I do come from a tradition where um, there is still that strong connection to 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 a place to a a particular side where you can go to to commune where it feels like there is a direct um portal between the living and the non living mm. where you can you can really hope for a kind of conversation to happen where you could you could once you're available for it, um, um, bring yourself to, to, to that conversation. And I'm, I'm, I'm generally, I, I think, storytelling, I do 
like to think of it as something that is continuous. I mean, stories happen whether or not we are ready and willing to tell them. Mm. And that stories continue to live whether or not we, mm. <laughs> we make the time to actually um, hold spaces for them. And I do, in my work, um, try to, from memory fragments, reconfigure what those stories could potentially be. Um, I was unlucky to, to have not met um, many of the people in my family, and I have images, and I have broken languages, and I have, um, you know, just recipes from which um, I can sort of, in a way, listen to those stories. And, and I think when we continue to be available, and when we continue to, to really make time, um, um, we can recognize, we can see those stories as living and breathing things, and those places where those stories are located also as living and breathing um, entities um, that we need to revere, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. What do you think? <laughs> I've just... <laughs> oh God, I'm such a problem. No. You know, <laughs> I'm just thinking about you know, the fact that in a lot of contexts, people always kind of like to repeat this thing about black people, African people being storytellers, mm -hmm. as though <laughs> since the invention of the printing press, white yeah. people have not said anything. They, they just recent culture, and we are the oral people. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so thinking about that, but also at the same time, wanting to acknowledge the fact that at least in my practice, in my work, Storytelling is very important. Mm -hmm. And because I'm loud, so I tell stories a lot. And kind of like stories have become a site for me to imagine social transformation. Mm -hmm. That stories, I think, yield more, at least in my world, mm -hmm. than doing theoretical work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just kind of like finding ways of telling stories that pushes thinking without the need for explaining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but, mm -hmm. but not because mm -hmm. I'm an African and I'm very oral. <laughs> yeah. No, it's yeah. not about my grandmother or anything. It's yeah. just... <laughs> and you can write. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think for me, I have always wondered um, about what a conversation with an elder would, mm. would, would be like. And I think because I do not know what that is per oh. se, I try to go back um, in time mm. and go back to, to those, those things that we consider as traditions to look for those answers mm. um, to, 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 to help me move forward. I think, um, so my practice is generally very um, sort of centered around that. It's mm. really because I want to understand, it's because I want to know who came before me. Mm. Um, I was raised in a um, single parent home. I actually don't know my grandparents on my father's side. And I have no idea who these people are. And I've heard things. And um, in sort of the way I create stories, I am sort of giving them certain um, informations that I would have wished they had, or things that I would have wished I would have been told or learned about them. And so, yeah, that's kind of like my connection to it. I'm still trying to figure out myself how I figure out um, where I come from out and talk about we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in a way. Yeah, thanks. Chao? Chao, you wanna, wanna say something? No, I, I, think, I think we've uh, covered it pretty well. What did she say? What did you say? Can you? Uh, I, said, okay. I think that they've covered it pretty well. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Any thoughts on storytelling nature from the audience? I wonder if it makes sense to go to that mic for the child to also listen. Ah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So, so is that gonna work? So then you can use the the lecture in Kabul or who who Oh, someone will have to come oh. to the front. Mm -hmm. So this will take long. Ah, yeah. Hello, Chao. <laughs> Chao, you can hear me. Yes, uh, just quick comments about land, because I happen to come from the same ethnic group uh, that 
uh, Dr. Gumi mentioned, that is reputed to be blood hungry, uh, which is also very colonial. Uh, because everybody who likes land, you have to live on land. Mm. Uh, the pastoralists go around uh, with their animals following the seasons because that's how they farm. They farm all their own way of getting access to food is to travel with their animals and that's how their lifestyle, all their life and culture is designed because that's how they access food. For my people, the way they designed their life was to farm permanently. And that's how the, if the government, governance was designed for, for permanent people using land and using clan as a system of government. That people who are families <coughs> govern themselves and if things go beyond that then several clans will come together for bigger things. So, but when the colonialists came, they displaced them and unlike other people, uh, actually they took, they displaced those uh, people from my region because they had land that they really wanted for whatever reason and they pushed these people elsewhere. Uh, so this just one message to mention that. But in my culture, land is very important because that's where you build memories. You, you get food and memories, those are two fuels for life. You know, and they give you guidance, and they give you reference from where you come from. That's what you are, uh, where you go. Very important. Uh, also, I wanted to mention about language. The la the word we use for stomach uh, is mohoda, and the word mm -hmm. you, that's for uh, da da is mm -hmm. stomach da. But mohoda is where you farm. So mohoda and da is very, very similar words. They have same, very similar roots. So while other people think other ways about our ethnic group and our language, desire for land is fine. That's what they think. But this is, I'm saying, what we think as an anthropologist. That uh, as a personal authority, I can say, the reason why we value land is because we la value food, we value food security, we value our culture and connection. And you're just like you're connected to womb, we come from the womb, and that's very scientific. We, tr we trace our genealogy through the mitochondria of the womb. So, so that. So uh, finally, out of that, final comment is about the value of land in mythology, as I mentioned yesterday. There is two dichotomy. We have land that we associate with, that we tend, we have to work on this land, physically. We have land that is mythological or religious. The Garden of Eden. Nobody works on the Garden of Eden. It's just something that happens. In the Upanishad, in the Gilgamesh, uh, uh, mythology of the Gilgamesh, he had to go to the land uh, called Dilma, the land where you go and get uh, the secret of eternity, where, where you, you can live forever. Uh, Voltaire says, after being very, very disappointed with the government, he says, okay, everybody just needs a, a garden to till so that you can have uh, somewhere, uh, you, you, you can stay away from all the madness. So there's this permanence that we need to uh, all just recognize that, you know, or the, uh, you know, uh, there are so many dimensions of life. It's not just for colonial, uh, and it's not just because of the mm. Thank you, Chef Kabui. I just got a sign. Time is running. Yeah. Um, one more topic I would really love to talk uh, to you about, the body, body and nature. I mean, we talked about this dichotomy, body, nature. It, we have to challenge this. Uh, so how does our body perceive nature, how do we behave when we're outside, um, sensations, bodily sensations and reactions on nature. I think we learn more this, uh, this afternoon about how to think with the body from Sekridur Torgai's daughter. Um, your thoughts on this body and nature?
It's child for us all. <laughs> How do you want to take well, a lead on that? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll start. Um, well, I'm just thinking, I think my reference point for this is a sign that um, I grew up seeing, and it's still very common to see it in many places, at least in Nairobi, do not step on the grass. Mm. And how the feeling of stepping on the grass, especially barefoot, is absolutely calming and grounding and lifting. But at the same time, that this idea that you are not supposed to be on the grass and that when the grass is manicured and it's perfect and it's taken care of, it's for you to see but not to feel. I mean, I think it's hard to speak about a relationship to to body outside maybe an individual an individual experience. I think that um, the expression of, of of body and land is not just in in the physicality of it, but also how you how you experience and how you internalize your own relationship to the land. Um, what it as we started this conversation by looking at memory and looking at you know the the intersection between the two, and I think that the the landscape, if I say the landscape of your memory um, and and your your relationship with your memory and with your body is also a relationship with the land and how you relate with the land. Maybe I'll have more thoughts uh, later, but I, I think I'm just kind of speaking um, what's coming into my head. Mm-hmm. I think um, I can just share one one memory. Um, I, I'm trained as a dancer, and when I was still in dance school, there was one teacher that always took us out in the park and do the class there. And it was so, so different to do these dance exercises because the body behaves differently when you're outside. Because um, as a dancer, you are always trained as to perceive everything that is around you, 360 degree. You have to position yourself in space. And when you're outside, it's a completely different feeling, this feeling of like infinity and you grow and you, I don't know, this is always the experience I have in mind that these dance classes were so, so different from the ones inside, even though we did exactly the same things. It's really interesting because what I'm trying to think about, I didn't think of land as a place to be romanticized until I came to Europe. <laughs> because I think when, when you hear land, you're thinking, we have to go to the farm at 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. You, you're thinking, mm-hmm. how can I escape this? You're thinking labor. You're thinking hard manual labor. Mm. Um, because, of course, families um, mm. um, rely on that, that labor to sustain and, and, and kids need to be put to school and money is needed. And so I, 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 I don't, I, my relationship to my body to land has always been, I want to escape. I think maybe that's also one of the reasons why I came to Europe, mm-hmm. because I was thinking, well, the grass is going on the other side, but well, we know that it is, maybe not. <laughs> and um, yeah, but I'm always thinking about labor first. I think that's the mm-hmm. word that comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but also, I mean, like, even the idea of a green space is, um, as, as you're saying, like, starting to think of these things when you're in a context that thinks of these things, right? Mm-hmm. Because I think those of us who grew up, like I partly grew up in boarding school in rural Kenya, and I only came into Nairobi much later in my life. And there was never the need for a green space because mm. your context is a green mm. space, mm-hmm. right? And then you come into the city and I think, ooh, in mid-sentence? <laughs> okay, um, you come into the city and then I think with kind of like later capitalism and urbanization then it's only when those green spaces don't exist anymore like the parks in the city, like people's parks being grabbed for development, mm-hmm. whatever that is, then you're like, oh, we need mm-hmm. to agitate for green space. Mm-hmm. But it's never been necessary mm-hmm. to think mm-hmm. of land in these ways. And mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was talking about yeah. mm-hmm. So the sign says, please stop now. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
<laughs> so I thank you all very, very much for the conversation, for your contributions, for the input, for your texts, for your performances. We make a short break mm -hmm. and we continue at 5 p.m. Icelandic time. Not five years. Not five years. <laughs> <laughs> Not five years. <laughs> <laughs> Not five years. <laughs> <laughs>